Um, the Cajun Prairie, also known as the, the Coastal Prairie or Great Southwest Prairie, and it goes by a number of other names. Um, but that's the topic of, of today and something I'm very passionate about um, and something that not many people know about here in, in Louisiana or elsewhere for that matter. Uh, a little journey uh, outline on our journey today is we'll talk about prairie. What is prairie? Um, a lot of people when I say that is say what? Yes, yes, we do have prairie in Louisiana. Um, we'll talk about coastal prairie geography, um, why we have prairie, how did we get prairie in Louisiana, uh, the, the cultural importance uh, of prairie as well, we'll touch on briefly. The status of coastal prairie, uh, the biota of our coastal prairie, and then finally, we'll wrap up with um, why we should be saving and, and talking about this, this ecosystem. So what is prairie or tall grass prairie? Tall grass prairie is a type of prairie we have here. Um, it's a treeless landscape, uh, very highly diverse with mostly perennials reaching six to nine feet in height, uh, very deep rooted plants as well. And these plants are drought tolerant, flood tolerant, and fire dependent. So as you can see on this map in the bottom right, Louisiana is at the southern most eastern terminus of the tall grass prairie uh, biome in North, in North America. And there are some differences between our prairies here uh, at the southern end and the Midwestern prairies uh, throughout the rest of, of North America. And that is we have a subtropical influence, whereas the other prairies have more of a temperate uh, influence. And this is from our climate not only today, but our climate on a geological time scale, uh, differences in, in our climate on a geological time scale, our, our geology itself. And because of these differences, we have a difference in our biota. Uh, Louisiana has several prairie types, not just the coastal prairie or the Cajun prairie, uh, but we also have the uh, calcareous prairie types and uh, saline prairie types. The calcareous are primarily in North Louisiana uh, and the saline prairie types are in north and historically southeast Louisiana as well. But we're going to focus on our tall grass coastal prairies for today. Just want to recognize that they, we do have a variety of prairie types here. So the geography of Louisiana coastal prairies. Uh, and this is a, uh, a photograph of some of the early uh, land surveys, the initial land surveys in Louisiana. If you look at the, through the top center part of the screen, it says, uh, part of the great Quelquishu Prairie. Uh, Quelquishu is a Takapaw, it, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but it's a Takapaw term for screaming eagle, and that's how Calcashu got its name. So this, this particular uh, excerpt from the land surveys is describing uh, the area around Lake Charles. And as you can see, numerous open areas, vast prairies with slender thin uh, rows of of trees and brush along the stream sides is what a historic landscape used to look like. And in Louisiana and in Texas is where the coastal prairie resides, that southern end of the tall grass prairie biome. And anything in purple, maroon, or pink uh, is tall grass prairie. And as you can see, uh, we're at the northern and most eastern end of the coastal prairie and at the southern most eastern end of the tall grass prairie biome altogether. We had about 2.2 million acres in Louisiana, a little over 6 million acres um, in Texas. And it got its name Coastal Prairie because it's just inland from the coastal marsh and that these systems are highly influenced by coastal systems. In Louisiana, the historical extent of our coastal prairie ran from just north of Ville Platte uh, all the way to just southeast uh, of New Iberia, and then from the Atchafalaya all the way west to the Sabine, and then it went extended beyond into Texas as we as we just discussed. Why do we have prairie in Louisiana? That's a question we often uh, receive. Um, there's four main reasons. Geology and climate I lumped in with geology because the climate change is on a geological time scale. Also soil, fire, and grazers. And we're going to talk about each of these uh, four things uh, as we move forward. Uh, the geology of Louisiana. 36 million years ago, uh, Louisiana was part of an ancient marine system. A lot of ancient marine deposits, as you can see, uh, three-fourths or greater part of the state was under uh, ocean, uh, ocean waters, marine systems. And as the systems, uh, as, as the climate changed, uh, 
Oh, one other thing I want to point out, the, the calcareous or the carbonate lumps that you see in the bottom right corner of the screen are about the size of a golf ball, a little bit bigger than a golf ball, a little bit smaller than a racquetball. I, I got these out of uh, Acadia Parish, about four feet below the surface, uh, digging. There's um, an extreme purely calcium carbonate, which is a marine deposit um, from a bed about four inches thick, four feet below the surface. Uh, and I, I thought it was pretty cool. I wanted to share that with you all. Uh, the relic marine deposits still exist. They're there uh, under, under our sur soil surface. Um, another big difference uh, is that Louisiana, uh, or influence, I guess, from, from, our, from a geological standpoint, is, is Louisiana has never been glaciated. In fact, most of the southeast has never been glaciated. And that's the reason why uh, the southeastern United States has the highest biodiv plant biodiversity in all of North America. And it, another reason why it's even more of a treasure than most people realize. Um, at one point, the, the, the glacial extent uh, extended just to the northern half of the of southeast. And in that time, the land was much, much drier. The, the atmosphere was much drier. And the ocean currents, or the oceans themselves, were much farther offshore. And southwest Louisiana is about 50, 60 miles farther offshore. And in Florida, is about 100 miles uh, west of where the current shoreline is today. And all of that was once a, a vast grassland. And because it was covered under previous marine deposits, especially in Louisiana, the landscape in the very southern end of, uh, of the Gulf Coast is very flat. Um, and because of that, since it's flat, when water flows off of it, it flows off in sheets, uh, creating deposits. Uh, and those deposits would build up in certain areas. And not only that, because so much of the uh, rainfall was tied up in, in gl glaciers and ice caps, uh, it was much more arid time period in the past historically as well. Uh, so we had a, a more arid climate. So uh, wind deposits were also a big factor in shaping our geology and soils here. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Uh, some of these geological processes helped create some unique features that we can still see today on, on our landscape. Uh, one of my favorites are the pimple mounds or Mima mounds. They're sometimes called hillocks. They're, they're small mounds uh, up to six feet in height, maybe 50 feet in diameter, but many times they're smaller than that. And you can see them in the picture in the top right. They're all the white or light green dots uh, in the area. And then there's another thing the Cajun French called the marais, which are small ponds or, or lakes. And you can see those as I point them out. They're the other circular features that are much darker uh, in circles. So we had these mounds, these marais, and then in other areas we call the inner mound flats, the areas in between the marais and the mounds. And then we had the riparian zones, which we kind of mentioned earlier, uh, those narrow stretches of forested land that flanked uh, stream channels. Um, and here's a picture of a, a desert action to, uh, in, in modern time, but this is something what the pimple mounds looked like in a historic time frame. Uh, when wind would blow across the surface, they would only get trapped at high points where uh, vegetation was present. And because those tended to be the only stable pieces of land, uh, vegetation would colonize there and help further stabilize it. And it would pick up more and more uh, wind deposits uh, as the time went on. So these mounds built up uh, in, in a process similar to that. And another uh, feature, just a black and white photo from the 1940s, you can see the real white uh, dots in the top right on the map. That's the pimple mounds. And the darker features are either marais or the riparian forest, the gallery forest. And the map on the left, I mean, excuse me, the map on the right, um, the shaded areas are areas where pimple mounds uh, occur. So we had those northwestern uh, wind coming from the northwest to the southeast uh, on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, blowing that sediment uh, down the Mississippi Valley, and it built up pimple mounds, primarily Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. Maybe a little bit, very faint ones left in, uh, in the, uh, Kansas and, and Missouri. And below, we have some pictures of marais. If you look, you can kind of see uh, some changes in the vegetation and circular pattern. And if you can't, I've added some uh, little red lining so you can kind of hopefully see the changes in vegetation pattern that I'm talking about, the slight depression. Uh, 
And that's how these mares develop. They're, the wind would blow across the landscape and cause deflations uh, in the landscape. It would blow and pick up uh, ground from those inner uh, se uh, sediment from those intermountain flats and deflate the landscape to create these mares. And if you still don't believe me, we have some LIDAR imagery. You can see the red dots are the highest uh, elevation and the lower, the, the cooler colors are lower in elevation. And you can see the pimple mounds, the orange and red, red dots uh, that are there. And then the circular features within embedded in those pimple mounds are the mares. So what's the big old deal? Uh, with unique topography, these mares and mounds, what's the point? What, what's so important about some, some bumps on the landscape? Well. The, these bumps, these depressions, they create micro topography, changes in a very short distance on the landscape. And these changes provide a number of gradients across the landscape, including a water gradient, soil texture gradient, soil chemistry and nutrient gradients. And because of all these gra uh, gradients, we have changes in biota in very short distances, which means there's a whole lot of different plants that can occupy various little niches in a very tight space due to this micro topography. And that equals high diversity. And what's important about high diversity? Well, this is a, some scribbled notes I have from a, a conference years ago. I, I don't have a quote uh, to assign it to uh, or an author, but this is the general gist of it. And I wanted to share it with you today. I mean, prairie and, and most ecosystems, in fact, but prairie, as we talk about here today, it's not one kind of grass, it's hundreds or thousands. Um, it's, it's the meadow rose, the wavy leaf thistle, all the blue stems, all the sunflowers, uh, the legumes, the lead plants, the milkweeds, just a variety of plants, and then all the animals that depend on them and the soil as, as well. Um, and the, it, this complex system helps it in, ensure against biological calamity. If it's hot one year or cold the next, or in a drought one year and, and a flood next, uh, some species will flourish while others uh, diminish. Um, there's somewhat of a false thought that the prairie is a, is a very standard or at, at an equilibrium, but yet it's, it's really a dynamic uh, system. And that diversity helps it balance uh, um, or survive th through that uh, dynamism. And uh, here's how the prairie bears uh, through ad adversity, all these hardships that it, that it endures. It's through the diversity itself. So it's, it's by diversity that these systems are able to persist and, and service wildlife and, and other uh, things, including ourselves. Um, and although it might look pretty above ground, there's a lot going on below ground. Um, and as you can see in the background, this is a switchgrass uh, or a little blue stem, uh, and the root system uh, on that is is uh, very long, very very tall compared to the actual plant itself, which is about six feet uh, tall right there. And our prairie soils, they have a clay pan, a BTG or argilla horizon, what we call it. And you can see it in the right picture on the bottom right, the BTG horizon, um, and sometimes a little bit higher in the center picture. It's around the uh, the black box right there is uh, highlighted each of the different soil profiles and this black box uh, the picture in the center is where i found the um the calcium carbonate that i showed you earlier and the picture all the way on the left shows these large and, and the center root is well over a centimeter in diameter busting through some of that dense thick clay pan uh, material um, and in our dig we, we stopped at six feet or a little bit below six feet but we were continuously finding roots all, all the way to that level uh in some studies in, in the midwestern states they found uh, switchgrass up to 17 feet uh below the surface root system uh and these weren't just fine hair roots i mean these roots were two to five millimeters thick uh, down there so what's the importance uh, about deep roots uh well it nutrient cycling these roots are pumping nutrients up out of the soil that are inaccessible for other wildlife and other species to to utilize so it's it's creating more nutrients available for other plants that might uh, for other plants and other species uh, that would eat the plant or, or could consume it as as a plant uh, uh, degrades on the soil surface that pulled these nutrients up from out of the ground all these minerals also these plants are pumping carbon down into the ground 
the deeper the roots, the more carbon is going down into the ground. Uh, and that leads to carbon sequestration. In fact, prairies are our best source of natural carbon sequestration. Uh, also water absorption. Um, they can help attenuate flood systems uh, through water absorption. And in many cases, the only way water is getting through that clay pan is if they follow down the narrow root channels. And some of these roots can be also pumping water down below ground uh, into their lower roots as well, uh, as well as up to the stems. And these dense, complex root systems provide stability and they provide a uh, larger habitat for, for life, especially subterraneous life. They provide more uh, avenues for uh, life underground, and not just macro or micro inverters, but also bacteria and, and fungi as well. So the soil is a living system in, in itself. And all living systems have to eat. And the plants are the mouth of the soil. They're taking that solar energy using their solar panels, their green uh, chlorophyll and pumping, creating those sugars and pumping it down into the ground. And roots are leaky systems. So everything else around it's picking up that energy. And here's a, besides the drawing, this is a, a real life. Uh, these are real plants in, in a display where they've been uh, brushed out and excavated uh, from the soil profile. And you can see the extensive root systems that many of these prairie plants have. Um, and there's a lot going on below ground, but there's also a lot happening above ground uh, as well. The root systems may stay alive all year long, but the above ground tissue uh, dies back because most of these plants are perennials each year. And that's because, uh, well, the perennials will naturally die back through their, through their uh, annual cycle, uh, but uh, also due to fire. Prairie plants have evolved with fire. In fact, they're fire dependent, what we call pyrophytic. Uh, habitats or communities. And these plants, uh, the above ground portions will burn off uh, when a fire comes through, but the below ground portions, as I stay, uh, said, stay alive. Um, and fire in does several things. It increases nutrients, sunlight, and space. Um, it releases all the nutrients that are tied up in dead vegetation or living vegetation even, uh, and deposits them right back there on the, on the soil surface. Um, this can allow rapid uh, plant growth and productivity right after a fire. In fact, in one study uh, in Cameron Parish on Spartina patens, uh, which is a prairie and marsh uh, grass, they found 11 inches of growth 10 days post burn. Now, this is pretty extreme. Uh, mostly, usually it would be 12 to 15 inches within a, uh, a month or two after post burn uh, on average. Um, but fire releases those nutrients and promotes promotes growth and production. Also, it clears off all that thatch, all that dead material blocking sunlight from hitting the soil surface and getting to the smaller plants underneath. It reduces that thatch, opens up opportunities for sunlight for uh, plants to emerge, and then those plants ramp up their sugar production uh, once that new sunlight is, is hitting them, after, once they start to re-sprout as well. And this also creates space. Uh, with a whole lot of dead material on the surface, that thatch suppresses um, seedlings from, from emerging and, and also prevents uh, soil to seed uh, or soil to ground or seed to ground uh, contact, which is essential for plant germination. So fire comes through, it cleans off the surface uh, of the ground and allows soils uh, to seed contact to increase, promoting more new plant uh, regeneration. As well, fire also eliminates trees on the landscape and brush. Very few plants and trees are uh, fire tolerant. And where does this fire come from? Well, it comes from storms. If you look, the central Gulf Coast is one of the highest uh, storm frequency uh, and precipitation rates in the south. And what comes along with those uh, rainstorms is lightning. Uh, Louisiana and Florida have the highest uh, flash density uh, in, in North America, pretty much. Uh, Arkansas and the Midwest do have some hot spots as well. Um, but fire would come through uh, on an 18 to 36 uh, month uh, rotation and, and, burn, uh, and, and burn through the landscape, rejuvenating it. In fact, if you look anywhere where you see a pink, red, orange, and yellow on this map, there were grass dominated 
uh, ecosystems or plant communities. Uh, and those areas were all either savanna, woodland, um, or some type of prairie or other grassland for the most part. Contrary to what we typically think of our landscape as being all forest. Uh, today, since the landscape is so broken up, uh, there's not a lot of opportunities for natural fire to occur and move across the landscape. And when it does, it gets put out immediately. So we supplement with something we call prescribed fire. Um, we have to go out and set fires in, in a prescription manner, in a careful manner, uh, to reenact uh, the natural low grain, low uh, going fires across the landscape. And we do this, as you can see in the top right, uh, during the growing season or the, the dry uh, season, uh, the fall, um, what, just like nature would do uh, across the landscape. Um, and here's a picture, a coastal prairie. Uh, May of 2015, um, it burned, uh, and then by, I'm, I'm sorry, March of 2015, it burned, and by May, it was already greening up. And if you look at the bottom, uh, you can already see some Baptisia bracteata uh, flowering right there, and also uh, going to fruit, as well as you start to see some other things flowering in the background. Uh, Unfortunately, due to the lack of fire on the landscape, we've developed some of these fireproof or areas or Louisiana jungles. Um, and without fire, prairies would change into brush forests, uh, brush or forest thickets, and they'd be overrun by many invasive species or, or uh, just simple woody species, natives as well. And the reason because uh, this brush eliminates the fine fuels on the surface, it shades it out. And the grass is what carries the fuel uh, across the landscape. So without that grass and the understory of that brush, it, it has a very hard time uh, catching fire and spreading. The only time it can really catch and spread is if it's an extreme wildfire uh, on the landscape. So once fire hits this brush line, it pretty much stops in almost every scenario, which also inhibits fire from moving across the landscape and makes our job much harder when we're trying to do a prescribed burn. Uh, here's an example uh, of post fire on the Deer Ridge Prairie in Vermilion Parish. You can see a persistent Chinese tallow tree thicket in the center. Uh, and this was September of 17. Um, it was treated with some herbicide. And you can see some of the areas around the margin uh, that burned, uh, that, that died from the herbicide. But the fire was unable to penetrate the center of these thickets. Uh, which will rebound after the fire as well. So it, it's hard. The fire can continuously, if it's persistent enough uh, at a short enough fire regime on an 18-month cycle, maybe, it could persistently chip away at, at that tallow thicket or that brush thicket. Uh, but without that, um, that, that thicket's going to remain there for a long period of time, if not take over the prairie eventually. And here's another example of uh, prairie uh, looking very great after a Shortly after a burn, uh, this is a picture of June of Texas coneflower, Rebecca texana, a rare plant we have, and it's a Louisiana and Texas endemic only, southwest Louisiana and uh, eastern Texas only. And this is just a couple months after a fire. It's, it's blooming and doing great. Um, in addition to fire, we had, and when fire wasn't on the landscape, we, we had grazers helping out uh, maintain the prairie and that's prehistoric grazers and uh, modern day grazers because the prairie is very old. Uh, in fact, we had there's there's uh, prehistoric uh, remnants or, or fossil remains uh, along the Vermilion River from mastodons and and mammoths and three toed horses and other different types of horses and bison bison antiquus uh, precursor to the bison bison. Uh, the species that we have today, uh, ground sloths, and many other um, megafauna that were all grazers here in Louisiana. These these fossils have been found in Louisiana, and they were living on a grassy landscape. We have the uh, glyptodonts, the herbaceous or grazing uh, armadillo, uh, the Columbian mammoth or mastodons. Uh, we also had and the courtesy of LSU Museum of Natural Sciences, the mastodon uh, tooth found in Louisiana in the top top right. 
and some of these species only died out probably less than 10,000 years ago, some of the um, fossil records indicate. We also had the Hipparion, the three-toed horse, giant sloths, and until the modern day, uh, we have the, the bison was the main driver, uh, a grazer on, on our landscape. Uh, and what do grazers do? How do they maintain the prairie? Well, they come through and typically large herds, uh, and when they do that, they turn up the sod, they break up that dense, dense sod, exposing the soil, allowing seed to soil contact, which is necessary for seed germination. Um, they also stimulate plant growth. Um, they remove biomass, uh, which allows more sun to hit the soil surface, triggering seed germination and plant regrowth after it's been grazed. Uh, bison, when they come through, and I assume other historic grazers as well, uh, they did a lot of top grazing. They kept moving. Uh, they took the most nutritious part and uh, with the least amount of lignin and, and kept going, the newer growth. And in fact, bison, unlike domestic cattle, have uh, compounds in their saliva when it interacts with plants that trigger plant hormones uh, that activate regrowth. So there's a relationship with prairie plants, especially grasses, and, and, and bison uh, on the landscape. Uh, not only do they graze and, and open up the landscape, but whenever a tree should happen to make it uh, on the prairie or a shrub, those bison sought it out and they plow it over. They use it for rubs uh, and, and that tree doesn't last very long. And these are iconic animals. They evoke a sense of history and grandeur, but bison in Louisiana, did we have bison in Louisiana? What were the grazers here in Louisiana? Well, yes, we, we definitely had bison in Louisiana, we have bison in the fossil records and we have bison uh, that were here uh, historically. The last confirmed bison kill in Louisiana was in the early 1800s, uh, maybe 1813 or, or 19 or some, uh, something like that. <clears throat> so these are uh, important uh, animals for, and part of Louisiana history and for the prairie, they're, they're very important as well. And we went from massive herds of bison across North America to massive mounds of, of dead bison. This is from the book, uh, Wildlife in Transition. I believe this is at Yosemite. Great book, uh, plug for the book there. I'd recommend anybody to read it. Um, but we nearly eliminated bison across the landscape and we've certainly done that here in Louisiana. And to bring them back, they need space. And we need to, for them to have space, we need prairie. Um, to bring them back and, and add them back to a part of Louisiana history and culture. In fact, Boudin, the recipes for boudin on Lewis and Clark's original journals, they learned from Native Americans in Kansas. Uh, and Cajuns French, when they came down here, learned it from the Atakapaw. Boudin is a bison uh, recipe from Native Americans. And that brings us to the Cajun culture. Uh, we have, there's an entire group of Cajuns that call themselves a the prairie Cajuns, um, my wife's family included. Uh, but you talk to them about the prairie and there's there's no connection. Uh, it's because the prairie has been gone from the landscape for such a long time that they don't recognize it anymore as part of their history or culture. And, but there's still glimpses and signs of it here and there. If you look back through historic photos, uh, you can see the great, and in Eunice today, the great uh, gateway to the great Southwest Prairie is the motto of Eunice. And where the West begins, the motto uh, of Scott. And there's some general stores which still have such uh, mottos and, and signs hanging on them. In fact, the American bison was first discovered and described on the coastal prairie. As the Spanish came up through Mexico northward and then over east uh, to Florida, uh, as they got into Texas coastal prairie, they started seeing herds of bison. And that's where the first reports of bison came from, were uh, coastal prairie. Um, however, over time, uh, as, as technology developed, we learned to, we developed a means to break up that sod and, and the prairie, the 2.2 million acres of prairie uh, were converted primarily to rice and sugarcane uh, fields. In North America, uh, in, in the United States, there's, throughout the United States, there's less than 1% uh, of prairie remains in, in nearly every state. Uh, with the United States and Canada, there's just under 4% of tall grass prairie remains in all of North America. And that's a very uh, liberal estimate. It's probably much lower than that because a lot of these prairies are in somewhat degraded condition and, and perhaps uh, 
not functioning. Um, but also in Louisiana, we have less than 1% of the Cajun prairie, uh, which makes it the most endangered ecosystem uh, in Louisiana and one of the most endangered in all of North America. It was once thought that we only had less than 100 acres left uh, of coastal prairie in Louisiana. Uh, however, after doing some thorough research and searching in areas that hadn't been uh, surveyed thoroughly uh, and that were under a different land use, primarily for ranching, we found uh, a lot more acreage, more than quadrupled our, our, our current estimates. Um, so we went from 2.2 million acres to about uh, 3,300 acres of, of coastal prairie remaining, which is 0.19% of the 2.2 million acres uh, is what we have left. Uh, about 200 acres of that is in railroad or urban remnants, linear remnants along railroads or utility corridors or, or right of ways that have never been developed. And then we have the rangeland and marsh fringing remnants, areas that are right along the, just north of the, of the marsh that haven't been developed, and then areas that are used for rangeland around the Lake Charles area, uh, because that area is not suitable for rice uh, or as suitable for rice. Um, so those prairies were able to persist. We have had several attempts at reestablishing prairies. Most are not uh, not very good representatives of prairies, but they are grasslands uh, and they do provide several benefits to prairie. They, they can be buffers, they can be connective corridors between uh, fragmented re prairie remnants, uh, and they, um, they also ensure that the land won't be developed if they're under some type of conservation easement. So if you add the, those two, the reestablished and remnant prairies together, we're at about 0.38%, still a, a very low uh, percentage uh, of what we used to have and this this ecosystem is, is very fragile and this is a landscape that I think when I think of Louisiana this this is what I think think of but not many people uh, do um, this picture is taken on coastal prairie remnant just outside of, of Lake Charles uh, several months after a burn but most people don't recognize if you show this picture to anybody very few people would ever think Louisiana. And why? It's because we're suffering from something called ecological amnesia. We've forgotten what our ecology used to be. We see the landscape of today and think that uh, in Southwest Louisiana is normal, is typical, or even healthy. Um, and it's not just the landscape itself, our wildlife. The last 17 red wolves were rounded up in the 70, 1970s from Louisiana and uh, Southeast Texas and they were shipped off to a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge to try to start a breeding program to, to uh, save the species. Uh, the whooping crane, it's making a comeback, but we typically don't think of whooping cranes or historically when we thought of Louisiana. The ornate box turtle and certainly the bison, as we've already mentioned, and it's not just these rare animals, it's also the grassland birds. Grassland birds are the uh, largest group of birds that are having the most significant uh, decline a rapid decline out of all the bird groups. Uh, and that's scissor tail fly catchers and meadow larks and uh, butcher birds and, and other things like that are, are in decline. And we've had ecological amnesia about our, our own wildlife. But this is a beautiful landscape. It offers a lot. Um, and like we talked about earlier uh, in the beginning, uh, our coastal prairies were a little bit different from our Midwestern prairies. And I'm gonna highlight some of those uh, components. So in North America and, and pretty much all tall grass prairie systems, these four grasses are, are, are present and abundant and uh, usually one or all of them are fairly dominant. They're very important grasses for tall grass prairie systems. And that's little blue stem, big blue stem, switchgrass, and Indian grass. And there's a fifth one, that's very important too. However, this one is not just in North America, it's in South America and North America, and that's Eastern Gamma. And we have some other grasses that are pretty unique to the coastal prairie system that do not extend into the western, the, the, the northern part of the coastal prairie, or the, excuse me, the northern part of the prairie biome uh, in North America. And that's brown seed, brown seed pasculum. It's the Gulf Coast in South America, so we're at its northern extent of its range. And then we also have slender blue stem, Gulf Coast, uh, or Gulf Cord grass, Florida paspalum, 
and Pinewood's drop seed. And we'll talk about each of these uh, briefly real quick. Little Blue Stem used to cover more land than any other species in Louisiana. It was the most dominant species out of all species, plant species in Louisiana. Uh, one of our most important species here. It's a North American species. It's little blue stem because it only gets to a height of about six feet typically. Um, it can be a blue green uh, when it first emerges and it turns to a maroon as it starts to age and then uh, post flowering or as it matures, it starts to turn uh, like a tawny brown. And then as it gets older, you can get a, a copper bronzy brown out of it. And to me, it still looks pretty nice uh, in the fall. And the Cajun French used to call this grass uh, pyrouge, uh, red straw, because of its red color that it would get uh, in the fall. And I think it would make an excellent landscape plant as, as well. Uh, and here's its big brother, big blue stem. Uh, some people call this the Mac Daddy of prairie grasses. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty big. Uh, as you can see, uh, Chuck there is not a short guy, but it, it, it's about six feet, a little over six, six, feet, six, six uh, right there in, in that picture in the bottom right. But it does reach nine feet in, in height. Um, and this is one of the top uh, grasses that cattle seek out uh, in the rangeland prairies. It's very little, almost no. Uh, Blue, big blue stem left in the rangeland prairies because it's got a high protein content and the cattle uh, take it out. Uh, switchgrass. Um, this is very important grass uh, for many reasons. Uh, I like the texture of it. It's got an open panicle, kind of creates this nice misty surface on top of the grass. Um, but it's, uh, it's important for biofuel research. There's a lot of research going on for biofuel work. This is grass probably has the deepest root penetration out of all the grasses uh, in the prairie system. Um, it is nice for landscape and it is also highly palatable, palatable for cattle. So there's very little of this left in the uh, rangeland prairie remnants uh, as well. And it is also culturally important for Native Americans because it has a lot of lignin in it. It stayed standing throughout the winter. So you could come and grab bunches of it, whack it off uh, with a good swing, and they'd have a bundle of straw ready for thatching on houses. Um, so Native Americans and some tribes even, I believe, regarded this as somewhat of a sacred plant, or at least in high regard. Uh, Indian grass, one of the most regal prairie grasses that we have. Uh, again, very little of it left in the rangeland remnants. It is is pretty palatable. Um, it has a really contrasting, if you look in the bottom right, a blue-green vegetation with yellow, uh, yellow seed heads uh, and sometimes even golden uh, seed heads. It's very striking. And this is a taller plant. This is a six to eight foot uh, plant, um, but would make a great backdrop in, in any open sunny, sunny garden. And this is a North American species again. Eastern gamma grass. I call this the this, this is a bully grass. Um, it can it can take a lot. Um, it can take flooding. It can take drought. It's very stout. It's a bunch grass. The one thing it can't take is grazing. This has got the highest protein content out of all of our grasses. Cattle love it. And as you can see in this picture on the bottom right, it's it's grazed down to just a few inches high. But you only find a few clumps of it left in the rangeland prairie remnants, and I've seen cattle actually paw at it to dig up roots, and they're eating the roots of it. Um, and this is the one prairie species that transcends. Uh, it's all the way through North America, and it goes well into South America a good bit, into the grassland systems in South America. It's also a relative of corn. It is edible, but you definitely need a lot of butter and salt to, to stomach that. And you can see uh, with Marcy Hardy planting some garo right there, but there's, even though it's winter, uh, this, this eastern gamma grass does make a, a nice backdrop uh, of a prairie or, or buffer between uh, building and, and, and landscaped areas as well. Uh, my photos and these photos here do uh, brown seed passable and no justice uh, whatsoever. Uh, this is a very nice plant. Uh, it's very small, uh, usually doesn't get uh, over two feet, mostly the foliage is, is usually below that. Um, but this, we're at its most northern end of its range. So this is the first plant we're talking about that does not extend into the northern prairies. This is one of the species that differentiates us from 
the northern uh, Midwestern prairies. And it's called brown seed pass. If you look in the top right and some of these other photos, you can see as it ages that that seed actually, as the lemnas and glooms degrade, it, it shows the brown seed within. In fact, I'm so fond of this grass, I would like to propose it as possibly a state grass one day. And no other state in the U.S. has uh, has this as their state grass too. So we'd be unique in that aspect as well. Um, now, I know this is not a prairie, but I want to show you what um, slender blue stem can look like on the landscape. It, it looks, especially when it rains and blows, it kind of looks like a nice, uh, this here looks a little bit messy, but it can look pretty manicured quaff of hair on the top of the soil uh, when the wind pushes it just right. Um, but this is slender blue stem, uh, very important grass, and another one that separates us from the northern prairies. We're at the most northern extent of its range. It's a very high quality. It's, it's very selective. It, it only grows on pimple mounds in the prairies uh, and then in sand hills in, in savannas as well. Uh, but it does not extend very far north. Uh, it doesn't extend into Arkansas, and it's uh, maybe one rare occurrence in Oklahoma. It's, it's a true... Gulf South uh, species for North America. And after a burn, it makes these nice bunches and you can see the, the seed head is, is very slender on the bottom right. Gulf cord grass, Spartina, Spartine. Um, I really like this grass too. I, I would even be open to opposing, proposing this as a state grass because no one else has, has this, uh, this grass. It, and it is unique to Louisiana and, and, and it is, uh, Louisiana prairies, uh, as, a, as opposed to the northern prairies. Um, it, it is a bunch of grass. It can be a little pokey. It is nearly evergreen, so it does could work well in a garden setting. Um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's not quite a marsh species. It, it occurs on the upper edge of the marsh or the lower edge of the prairie. Um, and it's a salt tolerant. In fact, it, it helified. It probably needs uh, salt. A good bit. It likes sandy soils, but it can also do salty clays. Um, and it's got a unique niche. It does make its way into Louisiana a good bit because of the pimple mounds. Uh, water gets wicked up around the edges of those pimple mounds, and salt accumulates. So it's got a niche uh, habitat right around the edges of the of those pimple mounds. And it has been used in landscaping uh, before, and it's got a nice, striking, tight seed head. Florida Paspalum. Uh, this is one grass. It, it does extend in the Midwest, but it's very rare uh, up there. It's very uncommon. In fact, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, they only have, I think, a couple of records. Uh, and it's the very southern tip of, of Illinois and, and Missouri and, and Kansas. It barely makes it into those states. Its core populations are uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, and Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and then some in the Carolinas. But this is a true grassland uh, species. It's a grassland obligate. It's in prairies and savannas only. It can take very xeric dry scenarios and it can also take very hydric wet clay clay flats. Um, and it's got one of the biggest seeds out of all the paspalums. Uh, very nice looking plant. And I get pretty excited because it, this plant is very conservative. It really does not tolerate disturbance in weedy areas very well. So if you come across this plant, you know you're in a, a remnant uh, if you're in southwest Louisiana, you know you're in a coastal prairie remnant uh, of some sort. Uh, even if it's fairly degraded, if that thing's still hanging on, you're in a remnant. Um, so I, I get pretty excited and jump for joy when I come across come across this one. Uh, Pinewoods drop seed. Now this is a Gulf South plant. It's a southeast plant, and it does extend a little bit into uh, Mexico. Um, one of the finest plants. Uh, that I think we have on the prairie. It's very short. It only comes to about uh, two feet, maybe two and a half uh, if it's got a lot of energy. Uh, but it is also nearly evergreen, uh, so it's pretty much green throughout the year. And it turns on when everything else is going to sleep. When everything else is finished for the year, this thing turns on in uh, September, October, early November. So it adds a little something uh, to the landscape then. And it's also very, very conservative uh, as far as where it occurs on the landscape. But it's easy to grow. All you need is a, a sand pit and don't water it. Uh, and you can grow this, this uh, thing. And this one only occurs on pimple mound, top of, tops of pimple mounds in the prairie system. 
So a flora as a whole, we have about, we've identified 720 uh, plant species in the coastal prairies of Louisiana alone. Um, that's not including Texas. Uh, about 9% of them are non-native and 34% uh, of what we call native but weedy and 57% of what we think are absolutely or largely played a significant role in the prairie systems historically. Um, so out of that 720, 33% are grasses and that's 124 species of grasses. So out of any one group, grasses have the most number of species um, and grasses have the occupy the largest amount of ground cover in, in prairie systems. But as far as diversity goes as a whole, the number of forbs are more diverse than the number of, uh, of grasses uh, out there. And sunflowers are the most diverse group uh, of forbs out there with 106 species so far identified. And then we have pea family or legumes and mints are, are next behind that in, in, the, in the forb category. Uh, these coastal prairies harbor a lot of rare plants, and this is not all of them. This is just a, a short list, and we've got many state, new state records studying these prairies, things that we didn't even know extended into Louisiana. Uh, we've extended known information, plant communities that these species are associated with. So we're learning a lot from studying these rangeland and other prairie remnants. And how do you not say that uh, grasses are not beautiful? I'll, I often get asked, does, grass, does it make a flower? I know what they mean. Does it, does it have a petal? Does it look showy? Uh, is it uh, flashy, but uh, grasses are not, but they still can look very, very pretty. Um, and just to sum up some things, why should we, why are we talking about, why are we spending time on this? Why should we save the coastal prairie of Louisiana and Texas? Uh, prairies uh, are the least protected, most threatened habitats worldwide. Grasslands worldwide uh, are the least protected uh, biome and plant communities. Uh, grasslands reduce erosion, chemical runoff, protect water quality, and they even improve water quality that's already been fairly degraded. So adding a grassland around or restoring a grassland around water quality can improve it. Uh, coastal prairies offset flooding and runoff. Um, losing the Cajun or coastal prairie, uh, the great southwest prairie, would leave our state poor in both beauty and natural diversity as well as cultural diversity. Conservation uh, is needed uh, for wildlife habitat, especially grassland birds, like I mentioned, and pollinators as well. Uh, each little prairie patch provides local seed sources. It, it, it provides uh, diversity, in not only species, but genetic diversity to help restore uh, other prairies, seeds and genetic diversity. Um, it provides a model for prairie restoration. We can, even though some of these small patches are highly disturbed, we can sift through that noise to some degree and help. it helps us piece together the puzzle of what our prairie systems look like. Uh, and they serve as a, as a refuge for wildlife, especially pollinators. Some pollinators, their entire, home, their entire life will be spent in one tenth acre patch. So a small coastal prairie remnant can sustain a lot of pollinator species and, and other species as well. Uh, it's an excellent source of carbon and probably the, I should put the best source of carbon sequestration, natural carbon sequestration that we have. Uh, it's um, potentially uh, could be used as a biofuel and, and promote uh, energy independence, uh, especially with switchgrass, like I mentioned. Uh, the Cajun culture, um, natural heritage and Louisiana history, it, it, preserving the coastal prairie is an important part of preserving all of those things and, and our identity our cultural identity specifically. Uh, and preserving biodiversity provides stability, uh, not only for us, but, but for all wildlife, all beings. Um, and it provides recreational opportunities and it can improve wildlife habitat. So with that, uh, I know we can't take any questions, but feel free to shoot me an email or shoot Dr. Keeney or Burden uh, an email. And you can reach me at B-E-A-R-L-Y at W-L-F dot L-A dot gov um, if you should have a, a question that you'd like me to to address um, and I hope you consider reaching out and, and joining some prairie restoration uh, and promote uh, prairie conservation with your uh, local agencies and, and public officials please please spread the word uh, that's the best thing you, you can do 
Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Burden Gardens uh, for this opportunity, uh, the LDW staff that have helped worked on some of these projects and conservation efforts, the landowners that have allowed us access, uh, especially LDWF and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for funding. And just an honorable mention, uh, Chalky Blue Stem, Andrew Pogon Capilpes, I think is one of the most uh, underutilized uh, grasses for uh, uh, landscape. Uh, it's a actually absolutely striking, gorgeous blue-green uh, blue green grass, and it gets to be about four, maybe six feet at high at best. So something to consider for the future. Thank you. Yes. Question if you could, but uh, are there places where you can buy some of these you can see to plants for landscaping? If there are, you might want to show that. Yeah, there, there are several places uh, you can buy these seed sources and plants uh, for landscaping. Um, Hilltop uh, Arboretum is, in, if you're in the Baton Rouge area, an excellent source uh, for buying some of these native seeds. Uh, almost eaten. Um, Plants is an online nursery. Um, the Caroline Dorman Preserve in Saline does have some of these plants for sale. Uh, Coastal Prairie Nurseries in Eunice does sell some of these plants, and they do sell seed. Uh, and there's a number of other seed producers uh, out there. Uh, UL uh, Ecology Center produces seed. Uh, Pastoric Restorations, uh, Native American Seed. Uh, these, those are the ones off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's many others that you can find some resources in, in uh, seed or, or plant material. Thank you.